Okay, hello everyone. This is the CircuitPython Weekly for Monday, March 7th, 2022. This is the time of the week when we get together to talk about all things CircuitPython. I'm Dan, and I'm sponsored by Adafruit to work on CircuitPython. CircuitPython is a version of Python designed to run on tiny computers called microcontrollers. CircuitPython development is primarily sponsored by Adafruit, so if you want to support them and CircuitPython, consider purchasing hardware from Adafruit.com. This meeting is hosted on the Adafruit Discord server. You can join anytime by going to adafru.it slash discord. You hold the meeting in the CircuitPython dev text channel and the CircuitPython voice channel in Discord. Typically, this meeting happens on Mondays at 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 11 a.m. Pacific Time in the United States, except when it coincides with the U.S. holiday. In the notes document, there's a link to a calendar you can view online or add to your favorite calendar app to get reminded. We also send notifications about upcoming meetings via Discord. If you'd like to receive these notifications, ask us to add you to the CircuitPythonistas Discord role. That's really all it's used for is for, to remind people. Uh, there is a notes doc to accompany the meeting. The notes doc contains timestamps to go along with the video so you can use the doc to skip around in the video. Let me put up a, a link to the notes doc. Um, after each meeting, we'll post a meeting, a link for the next meeting's notes document to the CircuitPython dev channel. Check the pinned messages at the top of the channel to find the latest notes doc so you add your notes to the, for the following meeting. If you wish to participate but cannot attend, you can leave hug reports and status updates in the notes document for us to read during the meeting. This meeting is held in five parts. The first is community news. The second is state of circuit Python. The third is hug reports. The fourth is status updates. And the fifth is in, in the weeds. I'll explain those parts as we go along. Um, I'll start off with community news. Um, community news, usually we take uh, the headlines from the weekly circuit Python uh, the weekly Python for microcontrollers newsletter. Um, you can visit adafruitdaily.com to subscribe to the newsletter. Thanks to Anne for putting the newsletter together. If you have any Python or hardware projects to share or find content you'd like to see included, please consider contributing to the newsletter. You can open a PR on GitHub. Um, you can um, uh, DM or uh, respond to an engineer on Twitter with the hashtag CircuitPython or email cpnews at adafruit.com with a link. And I, let's see, let's post, uh, so cpnews at, at adafruit.com is where you can send mail for the newsletter. All right, let me add a timestamp for all this. Okay. So I'll just I have a couple of headlines I, I took out of the newsletter. Um, it's not as busy a news week as it has been in the, in, in the past. But that's that's fine. It's nice to take a little break from so much news all the time. Um, there was a, a a developer meetup. The Dublin Linux Developer Group uh, uh, had a uh, video meetup with Adafruit on March fifth. Uh, Jeff Epler and Melissa um, LeBlanc Williams from Adafruit um, uh, attended that. Uh, and you can, there will be a, a recording of that meeting. I'm not sure it's been posted yet. Uh, Jeff, if you know whether it's been posted, but there's a link in the, um, in the channel where you can find out about when it will be available or, or just keep checking back there. Uh, Jeff's presentation was on From Zero to CircuitPython, where he explained about CircuitPython 
and Melissa explained about getting to Blinky with Blinka, and it's how to use um, Adafruit Blinka on Raspberry Pi to be able to use CircuitPython code and libraries. Okay, and then uh, another thing I want to um, make note of is the CircuitPython show um, podcast. Uh, it's a new independent podcast ho hosted by Paul Cutler, who qu can't be here today, unfortunately, focused on people doing awesome things with CircuitPython. Each episode features Paul in conversation with a guest for a 20 to 30 minute interview. Um, somebody's, thank you, Foamy Guy, for posting a link. The first episode aired on March 1st, featuring an interview with Katni. The second episode airs today, March 8th, with Maker Less Pounder, who uh, has been uh, doing things with CircuitPython for a long time, and we've seen a couple of times at the Pi, at PyCon in, um, in Cleveland, and had a great time talking with him. Okay. I, just a reminder about, uh, I already told you about the CircuitPython uh, newsletter. I won't repeat that here. Um, you can, uh, if you'd like to contribute news, as I said, you can send mail to CP News or you can submit a PR to, um, oh, it says today, March 8th. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah. Um, you, you can also, besides sending mail to CP News, you can also submit a pull request to the newsletter if you'd like to submit your own text. Whatever you'd like, we'll take it in any form you like. Okay, let's move on to the, the heart of the meeting, uh, the state of CircuitPython. First, we'll start with the uh, state of CircuitPython li libraries and Blinka, and I'll take another timestamp. Uh, we make uh, like midnight, uh, the previous midnight, we run a job that looks at all the um, pull requests and issues, outstanding issues for various components of CircuitPython and summarize them here. So uh, overall, in the past week, there were 25 pull requests merged. There were 20 authors. Um, There's some people I haven't seen here before, like Sidi Kalamini, uh, Squash, S Q U A S C H E, Flam 84, Five Tie. Maybe they've been around, Fab F. Uh, but thank you very much for all your um, pull requests. There were nine reviewers, and there were 29 closed issues by 11 people and 19 opened by 16 people, which is nice where we got ahead. We reduced the number of issues uh, by 10. Now I'll go on to the core section to summarize what's going with the CircuitPython core. Uh, Scott, would you like to do that? Do you have time? Sure. Be happy to do that. Okay, so the numbers for the core this week, uh, we had 11 pull requests merged from 11 different authors, which is pretty awesome, one to one. Uh, so thank you to all of our uh, authors there. We had four reviewers, so thank you to our, our reviewers as always. Uh, if you'd like to level up uh, from author to reviewer, please let us know. We're happy to help get more reviewers because the more reviewers we have, the more authors we can support. Uh, open pull request wise, we have 17 open. Uh, three of those are greater than 100 days old. Although I think one of those just got uh, pinged and I'll take a look at that. Um, besides that, uh, as always, uh, also, if you have an open pull request, please make sure that it's making some progress and it's clear kind of what the next steps are. If not, uh, please close it um, because the open pull request number is a common thing that people look at for the health of a project. So we want to keep that number as low as we can. Uh, issues wise, uh, which is a little bit different, uh, is uh, we had 10 closed issues by four people and seven open by seven people. So we're net down three, which is good uh, for a total of 505 open issues. Uh, this number does tend to grow slowly over time. And uh, one of the reasons is that we we have a very big bucket that we kind of categorize issues in into called long term. Uh, these are things that are interesting and we may want to do in the future, but uh, Adafruit funded folks haven't uh, necessarily prioritized them. Um, doesn't mean you can't do it, just means that uh, for those of us working for Adafruit aren't doing it as a priority. Uh, so we have 448 open issues in that long term category. 
And then we have one open issue in 7.2.x. This is kind of like the top priority uh, for something that may like be in a follow-up stable release, like a 7.2.1. Uh, we have four open issues for 7.3.0, which will be like the next kind of like... It's not a major revision, but uh, like feature revision or whatever it's called uh, of CircuitPython. Uh, 7.3 uh, largely is kind of destabilized by the new version of MicroPython coming in. Uh, not saying that MicroPython's not stable, just that the merge can, can cause some stability issues. So 7.3 will include uh, MicroPython 118, which will be cool. And we have four open issues there as well. Um, and then we have 22 open issues on 7xx, which are kind of broader, like we should probably do these sooner rather than later. Um, but yeah, that's uh, all of the stats for the CircuitPython core. I don't know, we always have negative one issue not assigned a milestone, so I don't understand that. <laughs> we'll figure that out. Yeah, I, I've been meaning to look at that math. But I think <laughs> it might have to do with like whether they have categories or don't have milestones or something like that. Okay. Um, All right. Well, thank you very much, Scott. Yeah. Okay. No problem. All right. We'll go on to libraries. Uh, Katni usually does the libraries. If you if you can, Katni, go ahead. Thanks, Dan. I think it's negative one because you just know what the next issue is going to be and you've already put it in a milestone. All right, so this applies to all of the Adafruit CircuitPython libraries, which is everything that begins with Adafruit underscore CircuitPython underscore, as well as a few extras. Uh, so across all of these repositories, we had 10 pull requests merged by eight different authors and six different reviewers. Um, the oldest merged pull request was four days old, and it leaves us with 18 open pull requests across all the libraries, which is amazing. We had 16 closed issues by eight people and 11 open by eight people, leaving us with 625 open issues. <clears throat> we have 209 labeled good first issue. If you're interested in contributing to CircuitPython on the Python side of things, check out circuitpython.org slash contributing. You'll find all of this information and more, including open pull requests and open issues. If you are new to everything, check out good first issues. Um, if and there, if you're new to everything, we also have a guide on contributing to CircuitPython using Git and GitHub, as well as uh, the fact that we're available on Discord um, every day or most days, um, and we can help you figure out a way to contribute that works for you. Uh, if you're interested in reviewing, check out the open pull requests. Leave a comment. Let us know you tested it. Let us know that you took a look at the code and it looks good to you. Um, any of that sort of thing always helps. Um, and if you get comfortable with that and you're interested in joining the review team, we can uh, look at that at that time. In terms of library updates in the last seven days, there were no new libraries, but there is a short list of updated libraries that is available in the notes if you are interested. And that's what I've got. Okay, thank you, Katni. Okay, we'll move on to uh, the state of Blinka. Uh, Melissa, if you're available, go ahead. Yeah, just a second now. Just trying to find my place in the notes here. Uh, okay, so for Blinka, which is our CircuitPython compatibility layer for MicroPython, Raspberry Pi, and other single board computers, this week we had four pull requests merged by three authors and three reviewers. There are currently eight open pull requests. There were three closed issues by two people and one open by one person, leaving a net of 71 open issues. There were 14,588 Pi Wheels downloads in the last month, and we are currently supporting 87 boards. So overall, it's been a little bit more activity for Blanca than we had been getting. So okay. cool. Thank you very much, Melissa. OK, now we'll move on to Hug Reports. Uh, Hug Reports is a chance to highlight folks in the Circuit Python community and beyond who are doing awesome things. We do this. Uh, in a kind of a round robin alphabetical order, except the um, host starts first, as an example. And we'll just go down the list alphabetically. If you're text only or missing the meeting, but have hug reports, uh, I'll read them off as I get to you in the list. And I just want to say that the idea of hug reports is something that Adafruit has been doing internally in their um, weekly company meetings for years. And so we adopted that. It was a great idea. 
Okay. So uh, first I'd like to thank uh, Rick Sorensen, who's a new contributor for their first P PR, which was to fix some uh, pin names and assignments for the Ciduino, uh Xiao, Sam21D, D Sam 21 There are a bunch of similar boards that have different things on them, but this, there were some errors, particularly with the LED pins. That was very helpful. Thanks to Dave Putz, who's continuing to contribute really useful fixes. Um, and thanks for a discussion in Discord between uh, myself, Foamy Guy, Tectric, Naradoc, and Jeff, and I think maybe some other people for some discussion about typing annotation, which is a continuing thing that is introducing more problems but more other good things into our code. It makes our code uh, safer and makes it easier to use in an IDE but it, we also have to keep introducing new features and new types to support it. Okay, uh, Deshipu, you can go ahead. Uh, okay, uh, thanks to Mark, uh, Dan, and uh, Scott for the PR reviews. Really helpful. And uh, thanks to Jeff for the work on parallel display and the camera. I'm now trying to use those modules and uh, it's a uh, Good uh, piece of work. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, foamy guy, go ahead. All right, thanks, Dan. Um, hard reports this week. Thank you to Scott for having me on uh, Deep Dive this past Friday, and also, more generally, just for starting up the Deep Dive. Uh, it's been a fascinating and inspirational show to watch. Um, thank you to Dexter Starbird who reviewed a PR and gave some good suggestions for some work I did this week. And then uh, lastly, thanks to you, Dan, for the great examples and explanations in the cooperative multitasking guide. Uh, I had a chance to sit down and really dig into that over the weekend, and uh, I found it quite helpful. So thanks. Thank you very much. OK. OK, Jeff, it's your turn now. All right. Uh, I wanted to start off by thanking Lamore for perfecting some camera code that I started way back last fall. Feels like a really long time ago to PT for always doing things thoughtfully and revising your approach when it's necessary instead of doubling down, which is all too easy to do. To Scott, thank you for all the deep dives. We expect you back at some point. And uh, to Maker Melissa, thanks for presenting with me to the Dublin uh, Linux group on Saturday, and as well to the organizer, Neil, for inviting us. OK, thanks, Jeff. OK, Jerry, you can go ahead. Yeah, hi, it's a group hug to the whole team. Thanks. Thank you very much. OK, next up is Katni. Hello. So I have uh, a hug report for Nicholas Tullerby for the latest uh, Mew release, the latest stable release, which might have been last week. But I don't think I got in a hug report for that. So belated hug report for that. Um, to Dan for all the help with a not exactly circuit Python bug that I found. Um, to Carter for explaining pull-ups and pull-downs, uh, as well as internal versus external. Um, it started as a question about how do I figure out whether I need a pull-up or a pull-down in code without trial and error. And turns out the particular pin I was dealing with was um, not clear which one you were supposed to use anyway. So uh, it wasn't entirely me, but uh, by the end of the conversation, it cleared up um, a lot of uh, just general not information that I had in my head. Um, so that was super helpful. To uh, Keith, the EE, for showing an excellent example of self-care by taking time out for himself. And to Phil for beginning discussions about PyCon 2022. That's what I've got. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, KMatch, you can go ahead now. KMatch is marked as text oh, only. Text only, sorry. All right, I'm looking at three things at once. I will go ahead and read theirs. Thanks to Tanud for the live stream and the good conversation with Foamy Guy. And thanks to Lady Ada, Lady Ada for making all the available, available all the helpful schematics and board layouts for me to learn from. Yes, you can learn a lot about hardware design by just looking at how we design boards, how Lady Ada designs boards. Okay, uh, next up is Maker Melissa. I wanted to give a hug to Five Tide for adding the USB HID to Blinka, uh, to Jepler for presenting with me at the Dublin Linux Developers Group on Saturday, and to Neil, the organizer who invited us, uh, to Katney for 
organizing PyCon and a group might be everyone else. Okay, thank you. Okay, Tammy makes things. You can go ahead. I just had a group hug to everybody for being awesome today. Oh, thank you very much. All right, I'll read uh, Tectric, who's not here, who's 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 uh, lurking, and can't. It's not going to speak at the moment. Before I take a time code. Okay. Thanks to Jerry, Anecdata, and Katni for help in reviewing, testing, and fixing my SI seventy two hundred one PR. Uh, thanks to Foamy Guy for always being a pleasure to work on with PRs and issues. Thanks to Paul Kettler and Katni from an awesome circuit for an awesome circuit, circuit Python show podcast episode last week. And group hug to all the contributors and, maintain, and maintainers. My PR to grad school was recently merged, and this community played a pivotal role in my decision to apply. Well, that's fantastic. All right. Paul Cutler is not in the meeting. Um, I'll read theirs. Group hugged everyone who listened and supported, listened to and supported the Circuit Python show's first episode last week. And finally, Scott. Hello. Um, okay, first a hug report to Foamy Guy for joining my stream for a chat and keeping the deep dive going while I'm on leave. Uh, next, I have a hug for Tak and Sekigon Gonok uh, for creating, for one, creating PIO USB host stuff, open sourcing it, and then being responsive to Tak on a GitHub issue. So excited to see that moving forward. Uh, thank you to both of those folks for pushing it forward. And uh, lastly, up thanks to Anic Data for helping with requests issues. It's really nice to have. Uh, uh, you seem to me to be an expert in Wi-Fi stuff, so thank you for for contributing, and we really appreciate it. Okay, thank you. All right, now we'll move on to the next session section, which is status updates. This is our time to sync up on what each of us are doing. Uh, again, I'll start with me as an example, and then we'll go down the list alphabetically. You can either uh, speak or I can just read what you've typed in. No problem. If there's, if we end up discussing something, uh, we can, that in be, discussion becomes a little involved, we can discuss it in, in the weeds. So don't feel bad about bringing up a discussion topic, which we can then continue on later. All right. Um, I'll make a guess at the time code here. And I'll go ahead. Um, so I'm still working on this uh, auto reload issue for SAMD21. Uh, the problem was that auto reload would not happen sometimes when you wrote a file. And I have it working much better, but it still isn't quite working. There's a the logic for um, when you do auto reload and when you do a lot of other things is very hairy inside main. See, and it looks like there might be some race conditions that are hard to figure out. And uh, I may submit something that works better, but is not perfect right now and move on to some other things. And there are plenty of other issues still to work on that I'd like to do for 721 or 730. Um, I'm still keeping an eye on async IO things. People are submitting PRs or support requests, and I'm still working on the async uh, HTTP client, though I don't really haven't haven't really done any work on that in about a week, and there's still some more outstanding things to do for the Circuit Python typing library. Um, we need to add some uh, from from future import annotations stuff, which I have a PR for, but uh, it's having some re self referential problems, and I have to get that working. And I found in the course of doing that, I found a bug in Ubuntu 2204, uh, the upcoming release in which uh, the VN part of Circuit Py of Python was not working. Somebody else found it ahead of me, but it, I was affected by it also. So I have to work around that bug in order just to test it. Okay, go ahead, uh, Deshipu. Uh, okay, so I made another attempt at the camera out uh, on the ESP32S2. And this time, previously, it at least went through the camera initialization. This time, 
it's I to see device not found with the same hardware and the same code. So something is changing in the library for sure, but not sure what's uh, going on there. Going to investigate further. Uh, I made a peer for 9-bit uh, mode uh, for for wires so that we can uh, support 9-bit mode on the displays, and that let me uh, get the RH112 display, also known as the Nokia 1202 display working, which is a very nice small uh, TFT display, and that doesn't need backlight, so it's super low power. Uh, and uh, I also, I'm also working on uh, getting the Maker Fabs ESP32 S2 parallel TFT board to work. I received uh, one for free from them, and uh, I, I got the uh, circuit Python working on it. Now I'm trying to get the display to work. It's fun because it's a 16-bit display. Uh, for now, I switched it to 8-bit mode because 16-bit doesn't seem to be uh, yet finished for par parallel display. But I still can't get the right initialization for the display to, to work properly, so that's, uh, that needs some more work. Uh, I finally made the PR for uh, the option for removing Blinka logo from, from the displays. Uh, that's useful for the smaller displays uh, or when you don't want to have a burn in your OLED displays or, or things like that might be also useful for saving some bytes on smaller builds. Uh, I made a, another handheld device, this time with a nice 3.2 uh, uh, screen. So that's uh, uh, it, it runs the same uh, stage uh, game library as the others, so not much new in there. And I also made an experimental keyboard with the ESP32 S3 using the Unexpected Makers uh, Tiny S3 uh, board on this. Right now it's only working in the wired mode because the BLE service is yet not supported on CircuitPython on this platform. But uh, I plan to eventually make it wireless and see how the power modes work on the on, on those boards and how can I can make it not uh, eat through the whole battery in a day, hopefully. And uh, yeah, I also uh, saw that Joy is from the sensor watch is working on a port of uh, Circuit Python for some L22 port, and I'm very interested in that as well. I asked him. Uh, uh, about uh, wh where to, to look for his changes and uh, I want to get involved with that. But I don't, I, I can really uh, help a lot because this is uh, really low level stuff. So we will see. That's it. Thank you. Is there something really interesting about this ML22 chip or just low Yes, power? it has a built in LCD driver. Uh -huh. So you can drive uh, like bare LCDs, the, the ones that don't have the chip on glass uh, on them, with that uh, chip basically for free because it has the, uh, the same driver that normally is built in into the display. And those displays you can make custom ones, uh, and they are super cheap, like 50 cents a piece. So, and super low power because this is basically a capacitor. That is so very it's definitely interesting to, you know, all kinds of devices. Yeah, that's very interesting. Okay, thank you. All right. Okay, uh, Foamy guy, go ahead. All right, uh, last week I uh, updated the Webb, James Webb Telescope uh, project. That's been a couple of weeks in the, in the works, fixing some certificate things and... Um, all of that stuff is merged in now, so I went back to the actual project and uh, rewired it up to show the, the current data that's coming from the new data source. Um, I did some testing and work on a couple other smaller uh, PRs in the core, one for documentation, one for an older issue relating to on-disk bitmap. Um, I did some experimentation this week uh, with the AsyncIO library. Um, uh, working on cooperative multitasking, specifically with an eye towards display I.O. GUIs. Uh, so I created a new example and um, submitted a PR for that over the weekend. 
And then for the upcoming week, I'm actually, I have a couple of days of vacation scheduled, so I have limited involvement for a few days, but I'll be back towards the latter half of this week. Uh, but I don't know exactly what I'll be getting into just yet uh, when I do return. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Foamy Guy. Okay, um, Jeff, you can go ahead. Hello again. So uh, last week, as I mentioned earlier, I presented to the Dublin Linux Developers Meetup. The attendance was small, but it was great practice for me as I'm not a confident presenter. Hopefully we'll be able to make the video available within the next week, so keep an eye on the newsletter for that. Uh, floppy drive land continues. Over the past couple weeks, I've gained a deep understanding of how the Apple II floppy formats uh, work, uh, but I still haven't managed to write an image which reads reliably on my Apple II. Um, I have also been working on a hardware interface from the RP2040 Feather to an Apple II floppy drive, and uh, that is done to the extent that it's able to move the read-write head back and forth, it's able to spin the disk, and it's able to see the data coming out. Um, this week, I learned about some software that allows disk images to be transmitted to the Apple over an audio cable, and then the Apple can write its own disk. Uh, so that's called ADT Pro. It's open source software in Java. I'll be giving that a try soon. Um, I'm working on adapting Adafruit Floppy so that it can use the Apple II floppy drive mechanism uh, with the hardware interface that I've wired up that I mentioned a minute ago. Uh, I may have to modify the hardware to add an index sensor, which is a sensor that activates once per revolution of the floppy. Uh, I've got some ideas about how, that, how to do that reversibly, uh, but also some ideas about how that might not be necessary as long as your goal is only to copy um, non-copy protected floppies. Uh, so just generally, I'm trying to complete this circle of being able to get data off of an Apple floppy and put it back on a floppy that an Apple can use. Um, in other news, I made marshmallows from scratch on Saturday, and it wasn't too bad. Uh, I'll probably try again and see if I can get them fluffier. OK, thank you, Jeff. I, I looked for a marshmallow emoji in Discord. I could not find one. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, Jerry, go ahead. Hi. Um, I look for one, too. <laughs> um, so I got sidetracked of some, some MicroPython stuff this week, but learned some interesting things. So I'll share a few of them. Um, one is I was using the... Uh, oh, let me get rid of the cat. Oh, 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 oh. Um, I was using the uh, LSM6... DSOX um, um, accelerometer on on uh, with MicroPython and and um, found that in their in their driver section they have this really really nice example uh, of using some machine language um, they call it machine learning core um, you can upload these pre 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 predefined models to the LSM six DSOX and then it, you know, with very simple code, then you can have it detect certain types of motions. There's one for open. Uh, you put it on a door, and it'll tell you if the door is opening or closing. Uh, if you put it on your head, you can it can distinguish a head nod from a head shake. Um, there's one a simple, one, nice one where you can just tell what the orientation of the sensor is: is X up or Y up or X down or Z. You know, just gives you the sort of six um axes uh, uh, which one's facing up and that, um, they're all really pretty cool and they're very very easy to use so i thought i'd try and port that over to the circuit python library um i've got a bit, little bit of learning to do about how to how to work within that library structure but uh it, i think it should be fairly easy to port it over it's, it's just you just load this file into it and the files are available on a on a, a um, st micro site um and then while playing with MicroPython, I was playing with the new Feather ESP32 um, V2 board, the version 2 board. And this is just a heads up for anyone else who's using it. I tried, was trying to do something with it with this accelerometer. I wanted to use I squared C. And it MicroPython won't allow won't allow you to assign pin 20. And, and if you're looking in the pin definitions, pin 20 is not, not available, not defined. Um, and so it looks like the, the way the pin def is just set up is for, for previous boards um, or modules and not, not for the ESP32 Pico Mini O2, which is what's on, the, on this board. So I'm trying to work, work through that, understand it, and how to get around it, or maybe just have to wait until MicroPython adds another board definition. 
So, uh, yeah, so it's 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 kind of it, it's not a show. You can I moved just used another pin um, rather than pin twenty for SCL and it worked great. But it's just that pin doesn't exist in their in their build unless I'm using the wrong board. But I can't find another board built that would that would apply. I'm using the SPI RAM build. Well, I think the the boards right. Are there always pins? We always have fixes for pins, so they're not immune from that either. So okay, thank you very much, Jesse. Yep. Okay, um, Katni, go ahead. All right. So last week, I uh, got hung up on repeated bugs while trying to finish a guide. I usually love bug hunting, but this was getting old. After a lot of troubleshooting, sorted out that a microcontroller.cpu.temperature plus Wi-Fi bug is beyond CircuitPython. It's in the ESP IDF and updated a template to use a random number generator instead of the CPU temp along with Wi-Fi code. Filed an issue on the core for the CPU temp bug uh, with a link to the ESP IDF issue for tracking purposes. Um, <clears throat> created a few new templates uh, for CircuitPython, the LC709203 battery monitor uh, data reading, and Adafruit IO send and receive, um, and Arduino for a built-in TFT example, and the LC709203 battery monitor as well. Um, consolidated some ESP32 S2 uh, CircuitPython template code to simplify the guide templates. Uh, ran into a failed Feather TFT board, another bug. Um, it was a super weird failure, and apparently I barely missed out on destroying the USB port that the board was plugged into. Uh, belated hug report to Radomir for helping me troubleshoot that and teaching me not to bridge the ground in USB pins directly. Finally finished the Feather TFT guide and started PyCon 2022 planning. Uh, this week, I'll be adding the new, the new templates that I talked about earlier to the Feather ESP32 S2 guide. Um, once that's done, I'll be doing the Feather ESP32 V2 guide. In between there are some various miscellaneous. Uh, there's four new product guides incoming, the MCP23017. There's two new TFTs and uh, the VL53VCD. Um, the ADXL343 just had a Stemma QT revision. So that will be an updated guide as well. I may actually be walking um, Eva through how to do that uh, so that she can help out um, with those Stemma QT rev updates moving forward. Um, I have the Essentials template for Async I.O., which keeps getting bumped. It's, it's not a super high priority, but it's still on my list. And then continue PyCon 2022 planning. Um, in my off time, I didn't get any further last week um, than I was previously, but I'm working on a Discord bot for the Adafruit Discord server. The first major feature is it will flag unformatted code and provide info on how to format it. Um, but I'm looking forward to working on that again this week. Um, and that should be, I don't know, it seems like it's going to be fun. And that's what I've got. Okay. Thank you, Kat. Okay, next up is Kmatch, who's not here, so I'll read their contributions. Um, last week, studying uh, KiCad to make a board to simplify my display wiring and learning a lot from Lady Ada's schematics and layouts. F finalized pinout selection for ESP32 S3 to touch display panel, and minor progress on adding multiple lines to the Cartesian widget updates Hope to pick this back up in several weeks. This week, uh, add backlight driver and battery charger to my display driver schematic and finalize the board layout. Then experiment with ESP32 S3 IDF demo code for RGB displays. Other is slower progress last week and the next few weeks, some home construction projects that have bubbled up to the top of my list. Okay, thanks Kmatch. Okay, Maker Blissa, go ahead. Uh, last week, I worked. Uh, I added pre-commit support to Blinka, which involved uh, cleaning up a bunch of items that needed linting. I worked on preparing my talk for the um, Linux uh, developers group, and I worked on helping Lauren with some Whippersnapper firmware updater improvements and fixed an issue with platform detect on the BeagleBone on recent firmware versions. 
And this week I'm going to finish on Ketchup on a few more GitHub issues and possibly work on adding ESP32 C3 support to the Web Serial ESP tool. That's okay. it. Great. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, next up, Tammy, Tammy makes things. So um, last week I worked on refactoring the design for the Display I.O. card deck library that I'm working on. I realized as I started thinking through what I was doing that I was making it much more complicated than it needed to be. So I decided to go back and simplify before I started coding instead of afterwards. Um, I fixed some issues with video hardware on my MacBook so that I could do um, Twitch streaming. And I had two successful Twitch streams doing electronics and CircuitPython stuff, um, making, we did a little uh, MIDI controller made out of a macro pad. So that was fun. Um, my Twitch username is the same as my Discord username if people want to find me there. This week, I'm going to keep working on my card deck library. I'm doing two more Twitch streams. So the first one is scheduled weekly uh, Tuesdays at 7 p.m. Arizona time, and then Sunday at 10 a.m. Arizona time. And I specified both of those in Arizona time because I get confused by the whole time change thing since Arizona doesn't mostly change times. But we change relative to the time zones that are around us. Um, I also want to tackle some more of the open issues for adding type annotations to the libraries. Um, I ran into a small issue yesterday with the, the PICU tool for helping with CircuitPython code deployment. It um, wouldn't deploy to the macro pad because it said the board's memory was too large. Um, I think I figured out what's going on with that, and I need to just figure out a clean way to fix it. And then I'll submit a PR to the PICU tool for that. Um, and in other news, I got an offer um, over the weekend for an awesome, exciting new job doing data engineering with Python for a marketing company. I'm really excited. And although I don't know if the work that I've done with CircuitPython made me a better candidate for that job, being able to talk about that work certainly made me a more interesting candidate. So I'm excited about that and hugs to the community for, for creating this amazing thing that I can be a part of. And that's what I got. Okay, great. Congratulations, Tammy. That's terrific. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll go on to Tetrick, uh, who isn't here. Maybe, yeah. All right, I'll go ahead and read Tetrix because I did read their um, hug reports also. Uh, last week, Added suspend power functionality to the BNO055. Added heater control functionality to the SI7021 and some miscellaneous documentation updates. This week, more typing PRs. Picking back up my self-lighting manure project now using the Tiny S2. <clears throat> Looking for more issues across the libraries to start and starting to prepare and plan for grad school this fall. Congrats again on that. And now we'll go on to Scott. Hello. Uh, last week, I made pretty good progress on USB host. Uh, on the IMX, I can now list uh, connected devices and their VID, PID, product name, manufacturer name, and serial number. Um, I plan on uh, getting testing that on the Teensy 4.1 uh, today and then getting this as a PR. Um, you won't actually be able to talk to, to the device yet, um, but soon. Uh, let me keep down my list. I added USB specific exceptions uh, to match Pi USB. I created two simple examples, one for mouse and one for reading a keyboard. And then on Friday, I did the last deep dive before I go and leave uh, because the baby's due date is under three weeks away, which is pretty wild. Uh, two weeks from Friday, and uh, from next Friday. Uh, so this week, I'm gonna check in with Tax uh, Tiny USB work. It looks like he's still working on it. Uh, he's adding a raw API for reading and writing uh, endpoints directly. Uh, that we'll need to do the uh, PyUSB API. So uh, I may start uh, doing an example. <laughs> this is a little old. Um, I said I may start adding an example for IntelliKeys, uh, and I may also start experimenting with PIO DVI. Uh, but chatting with Lamore this morning, I think I'm actually going to take it a, a brief look at the ESP32S3 just to make sure that everything's in a pretty good space. 
Uh, in particular, there's a couple issues around deep sleep on the S3 that I'm going to take a look at. Um, so yeah, I'm going to be doing S3 stuff once I kind of wrap up uh, and put this USB host work on pause. And that's, uh, that's my plan. Okay, thank you very much, Scott. Okay, mm -hmm. we'll now move on to um, In the Weeds. Uh, in the Weeds is a chance for us to discuss some issues in more depth um, that people want to bounce off the community, get some ideas for, or just make announcements about. So uh, I'll start. Um, we had a discussion in the internal meeting just before this one about the fact that we have a lot of support issues and um, general people needing help with uh, ESP32, either, either ESP third plain ESP32 SPI or ESP32 S2 uh, Wi-Fi scripts that might mysteriously stop working at some point, often after several days. We're not really sure why this happens, um, and it would be helpful to figure out why the errors are happening. But the other thing that's true is that a lot of our example scripts don't necessarily do such great error recovery when something does go wrong. Um, Wi-Fi and wireless stuff in general is, there are going to be errors. Everybody knows that. Things go wrong, there's in interference, uh, hosts go down, all kinds of things can go wrong. So it would be good if we had some more canonical examples of how to make our Wi-Fi scripts more robust. And we talked about some ideas for this. One idea is simply to catch put a try accept around everything. And the easiest way to do that, instead of putting try accept at the top level, uh, we might encourage people to write a main function uh, and then call main and surround the call to main with try accept. That's one thing to do. That makes it simple to see where the try accept is, is, is happening. Uh, another thing that might be true is that I've, I recently saw an issue or a PR about the fact that we throw different kinds of exceptions in the Wi-Fi code. Sometimes we throw a runtime error, sometimes we throw IO error, and it might be helpful to regularize those. Some of them we want it, may want to change in the next major version because it would be an incompatibility. But it would be nice to go through all those and even perhaps inventory them all so that we can list what things cause exceptions and which functions might actually uh, cause exceptions to be thrown because it's not necessarily in the documentation. Uh, another the, thing can, that was suggested. I, yeah? Can I interrupt you here? I just have a quick suggestion. Yeah. Because, uh, it, if you are making like different classes for those exceptions, it might have, might be a good idea to have a, a class for recoverable errors in particular. So you can treat them differently than, than uh, errors that are for sure programming error and so on. Yes. So things like timeouts and uh, things like that uh, might might be convenient to have them as a separate class because it doesn't make sense to you know restart your code on uh, on memory on, on I don't know syntax error, but it may make sense on, on a timeout. That's a good idea. That's a very good point. Yes. Um, so, sort of, in, with respect to that, the next two suggestions are about restarting the code automatically. Um, you can do that two ways. You can use at exit, which was implemented and we haven't used too much. And you can also do use a kind of hidden feature of supervisor.setNextCodeFile, which said, if you get an error, run this other file. But you could also just say rerun code.py. Uh, both, both of these might work. So if other people have ideas about this, that would be great. Uh, some of you have had more experience writing uh, networking code than the rest of us, and you're more familiar with these kinds of errors. And if you can contribute, that'd be terrific. And eventually, the idea would be to redo the learned examples and perhaps come up with a few canonical, simple examples that people can then copy. So are there any, any other suggestions that people would uh, be interested in? mentioning. I'll add one thing to the um, alternatives you talked about so far. I know one of the people who um, has been having these problems with Matrix Portal is my friend Wintaru, and he's talked to you, Dan. Um, but his problems, as far as I've been able to understand them, are the, the VM locks up or something. So 
in that case, using, using the actual hardware watchdog um, to rescue the whole microcontroller in that case is another thing that you might want to do. And I think you may end up doing more than one of these things uh, yeah. to, to get the fully robust program that you need in the end. And this is due probably to perhaps there are some errors in the ESP IDF. We might be using it wrong or we're running out of some resource. We're not really or, sure. Or it's some very uncommon interaction between the uh, matrix portals, the RGB matrix display, which gets pretty low level, and something else. Um, yeah. You know, I know you've looked at it and it's not obvious what's going on, but you can't, you don't get back to the REPL. You don't control C out of it or any of those things. So yeah, it's, it's some bug, but what bug is it? And we don't know, but using the hardware watchdog, which I've told him to do and he hasn't, um, seems like what would be the fix in his particular case. And I'm sure it's true that in commercial products, they using having a hardware watchdog is really important so that people don't have to, because you want to reduce your support costs. So if you if the thing will restart automatically after it gets stuck, that's very helpful. So I, this is just something that I will be starting to look at. Um, and I, I will ask some of you for help uh, at some point. So thank you, and you can think about it in your spare time. Uh, we also talked about a safe mode.py. Uh, that's, that's another thing that we could use for a lot of things, and that, that would be, should be relatively easy to implement. Um, OK. And I see those comments in the, in the uh, chat. I'll take a look at those later. Very interesting. Kept one of the, Keith says, uh, Wi-Fi manager class with the try accepts has kept one of their, their ESP32 S2 feathers online since November. That's fantastic. Okay. <laughs> like I have a use for something, a, a, a long-term Wi-Fi monitoring thing, and I, but it would be at a remote location and I'm trying to figure out how, what's the best thing to do about that. Okay, um, Katni, you had something that you wanted to bring up as well. I do, um, and actually, I think you're the one who can answer it. Um, can you clarify where we're at with the type hint PRs and so on? Because I know we discussed it um, last week, I think, or maybe the week before, and folks are still working on new type hint PRs, and I, I'm vague on what our plan was with how we were going to deal with that um, in the interim between something you needed to do and something that hasn't happened or something to that effect. I'm fuzzy on it. Yeah, so I I have to, there's a, a PR that I haven't finished about um, doing from underscore future import annotations, and uh, I will finish that. And Tectric in particular, thank you for doing all the the these these PRs, but it might be the case that if we need to add more types or we need to fix some underlying infrastructure thing, we might hold off on them and don't don't take it personally. You know, we'll get to them, and uh, um, just to make sure that we have the infrastructure in place. One interesting thing, for instance, is that a lot of the if you look at the C Python infrastructure, the annotation libraries and stuff are a lot of them are P PYI files and those are not directly importable and um, but you use them with in, to generate stubs and to use tools like mypy and so maybe eventually we want to convert circuit python typing to be a library that is not really importable but you simply is simply there for use by the type checkers so there's a way to check whether or not um, you're doing typing, you can do from typing, uh, import all caps type checking, and that's false when the program is running and true when uh, the type checker is running. And so that's a way to avoid actually importing these things at all. Um, but that also requires um, making from future import annotations work. So there's kind of a pile up of things here. And I I've started to do some more research about understanding this, but I haven't finished. So uh, rest assured we're working on it, but it has brought up a whole bunch of things 
like versions of Python and what, what we how we how we should be what what what's the right way to do the imports that we were doing in a pretty casual way before and we have to be more careful about it. Okay, that's that's what I have to say about it. Um, so should we then have folks stop working on the type in PRs for now or are they okay for now to continue working on them? Um, I think like it's fine I, to work on with them. That? I just, some of them we might not merge right away. Okay, we might put them on. Okay. Board. Um, yeah. That's what I, that's yeah. the. But I wouldn't say like, stop. I mean, we it's still great to have that work done. It's just that we may have to go back, for instance, and edit some of them or, or or something. One reason to hold back on on, on merging them is that that if if we eventually are going to have to change the imports that are, are top of it, of any library that has annotations, then we want to minimize the amount of work that we have to do. Okay. Um, so, is there a way for someone reviewing the PR to recognize if it's okay to go in or needs to be held, or is there some kind of testing that they could do that will? Uh, allow them to see if it's okay? No, I mean, I think not really. I mean, I just, I, 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 I originally was talking about this holding business before I had made a previous change to the library, which is now fixed. It had to do with, with moving stuff out of Blinka and moving mm -hmm. stuff out of the core. And yeah. um, that PR got merged already. So it's, it's less on hold than it was. Okay. So... Um, part of what brings this up as well is that, um, when, uh, for the PyCon sprints, um, I like to be able to point folks to the good first issues. And obviously if we're still changing things on how type ints are to be done in circuit Python, we will probably need to go through and remove the good first issue label from those issues, which is not an, not a problem. I just need to know, you know, like a week ahead of time, what, um, what the status is. And that's not until the end of April. Yeah, maybe I'm, maybe I'm, I'm, I, and I'm kind of thinking on on the fly here. I mean, maybe this whole whole business. I said that last week, and maybe it's unnecessary now. Okay. I haven't thought about it hard enough. <laughs> so, uh, well, um, this currently really only applies, as far as I can tell, to Tech Trick and Tammy makes things. Yeah. Um, I think those are the two folks who are most active on those type in PRs. So I just wanted to, um, I, I didn't want them to be putting in work that uh, we weren't going to do something with, but um, it sounds like they're both fine to continue working on them uh, for now. And if the way we do them changes, we'll let everybody know um, at that point. Yeah, yeah. Does yeah. that sound so good? We really appreciate it. And the people who use IDEs love this because they really love the type annotations and they like, you know, this auto completion and stuff like that. So. I, I didn't even know what type annotations were before we started this. And I use PyCharm and it is so nice. <laughs> yeah, right. And so it's even nicer when you give it hints. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, okay, excellent. Um, I just wanted some clarification on what the deal was there and wanted to make sure that people weren't doing work that uh, we weren't gonna be able to uh, use. Okay. So thanks, Dan. Sure, you're welcome. Okay, so is there anything else in the weeds? If not, uh, we can wrap up. Let me take a timestamp for the wrap up. So um, thank you all for participating. And next week's meeting is on Monday at 2 p.m. as usual, however, uh, Daylight Savings Time starts in the U.S. next uh, Sunday in the middle, you know, at 2 a.m. or whatever. So um, spring forward, fall back. So um, if you live in a country where that is not synchronized with the U.S., and I think none of them are <laughs> in terms of Daylight Savings Time, uh, make sure that you check the local time with respect to 2 p.m. Eastern Time in the United States. It'll be UTC plus four. Someone has written in here. Thank you very much. You can use our online calendar with your favorite calendar app so you can see the, the, the meeting in your local time zone. Okay. Anything else? If not, uh, thank you very much. And thanks, everybody, for attending. And I will stop recording. <laughs>